Well, good morning. Welcome to Horizon. We're starting a brand new series this morning called Mastermind. Ready to do this? series called Mastermind, where we're looking at how we can really look at what we think about, maybe even think about what we think about. Now, to do that, a good friend of mine, we've known each other almost, man, 15 plus years. My friend Chris is a therapist. And I want to know, like, why is it hard for people to see their blind spots? You know, as you're working with people, as you're working, you know, related to people, how as a counselor or therapist have you seen it's difficult for people to see the blind spots in their life? Well, with the blind spots, it's very similar to our eye. And with our eye, we just see what's right ahead. In order to see it differently, we have to physically change our position. Well, it's the same thing here, that we have to change our thoughts. Otherwise, our thoughts are just straight ahead. We need, in order to change our perception, change our position 
Therefore, we need to be open for it. And this is where we get stuck because it's painful to be vulnerable, to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, to have someone point out a blind spot. It initially hurts. Whoa. Then, though, we have a choice. We can take a look at it or we can continue on the path we're on. But then we're missing that opportunity. Basically, we're also lazy. It's work. It's work to take a look at our blind spots. And yes, it can be uncomfortable, but if we put our emotions aside and just look at, this is an opportunity for me to see things differently. Another thing that can prevent us from looking at or changing, biases. Bias is a big blind spot. And that's what I see time and time again. Um, biases that I know better than you, I am superior, or this is better, or the way I see it is the way it is. Isn't it amazing how inconsistent we are? Because in one sense, you know, I'll excuse my own behavior, I'll rationalize my own behavior, I'll say, well, there's a good reason I did that, and then I'll turn right back around, and when somebody brings it up or confronts me with something that's true, I mean, I can filter that out, they got a bad attitude, uh, they don't have a good reason for bringing this up, maybe, you know, they shouldn't be so crabby. So I can quickly dismiss stuff that's feedback I should incorporate, and I can quickly excuse my behavior rather than seeing it for what it is. Absolutely. It's easy to see the splinters in others, and we don't see our own plank. And therefore, it's, we're defensive. And our defensive, defensiveness has been built up over years. And we need to be able to take it down. In order to do so, I think we need to be in a safe environment where we're not being criticized, we're not being judged, and trusting that the person is sharing with us because they care about us. And I think that is absolutely paramount. I think that's what's uh, interesting about what the Bible offers, the idea that God loves us, He cares about us, He unconditionally accepts us, and in that, our behaviors, our mistakes, or whatever those are, we can fully embrace them, look at them, because He's not criticizing who we are, He's trying to help us discover what we could be. So that's what we're going to look at today in Mastermind. So we're in this new series called Mastermind, and we're going to look at what is your mind set on? What are the thoughts you have? What are the ways you think? And how are the ways you think affecting the way you interpret data, the way you choose to feel, and the way you choose to react? So what is your mind set on, and why is it so hard for us to take criticism? Why is it so hard for us to be open to feedback? Why do we get defensive so quickly? Well, to understand that, let me uh, remind you a little bit about Mastermind. If you never played Mastermind growing up, it's a board game played with two people. And typically, one person goes over here, and they have a code that they're trying to have the other person discover. In this case, it's red, red, yellow, green. However, the other person doesn't know what that code is because the truth has been covered up. And so they're going to try and figure that out. So the other person has a combination. They might say, well, I think uh, it might be maybe yellow goes here and maybe blue goes here and maybe red goes here and maybe green goes here. And then the other person who's got the code will look at that without showing it, but will say, okay, you got one of them, a red one in the right spot. So they'll give you feedback. One of your pegs, I won't tell you which one, is the right color and the right spot. You've got another one, ooh, right color, right spot. No blues, and a green, you have the right green, but right color, different spot. And so then in the game of Mastermind, you will continue to try and guess, well, which ones do I think are in the right spots? Well, maybe I think red was in the wrong spots, so I moved that to here. I think green might have been here. I think blue, Maybe that's the one that's not there anymore. So I'm going to throw another, maybe a red one in and yellow. And so again, the, the person on the other end would give you feedback. Let's see, red one's in the right spot. Another red one. And your yellow one, ooh, no longer in the right spot. Right color, different spot. And then you've got another red one. Ooh, a new black one. Right color, wrong spot. And another one green, right color, right spot. And so during this process of playing the game, you're trying to figure out exactly the feedback you're getting, trying to deduce what the truth is, 
and trying to figure out how to realign your decisions, realign your guesses to try and get to the right code. And when you get to the right code, sure enough, it's revealed. Well, I think in this analogy of trying to master our mind, this is what life is like often. Someone, your spouse, your kids, your employer, you've tried to bring feedback to somebody else. And let's just say for the sake of this analogy, these different colors represent emotions. And you say, hey, uh, you're trying to talk to an employee that has a tendency to get angry. Maybe the red's anger. Uh, have you noticed uh, the way you react? You kind of have a short fuse. Or maybe there's a way in which um, you're angry at home and you have a spouse or a child who's been bringing up the fact that maybe you're blowing things out of proportion. Maybe it's fear. Yeah, you said, hey, the reason I didn't uh, start that business is because of such and such circumstance. But maybe it's really you were yellow with fear, but you don't want to admit that you're yellow with fear because... You don't want to see yourself as a fearful person. And maybe there's an area of envy that maybe your marriage could be better if you could deal with some inner envy. However, none of those are ways that you want to see yourself. So you cover up that truth because when you begin to see yourself, you see yourself very differently. In fact, when I ask you to describe yourself, you say, let me tell you a little bit about me. I am calm. I am cool. And I am collected. Oh, not collected. Let's find another collected here. And collected. This is how you perceive yourself, right? And so because you perceive yourself a certain way, you're not open to feedback that maybe you have some areas of your life that are angry or fearful or envious. And so you put that code in place and and maybe you get feedback that's like, no, no, no. What do you mean? I didn't get any of them right? No. No. And it really shakes your self-identity because you can't imagine that the way you perceive yourself and the way other people, let alone God, perceive you can be that far off. And you're like, all right, well, maybe I get angry occasionally or I get fearful every once in a while. All right, I'll admit that. And so you make another guess. But in general, I'm still a calm, collected, cool person. And again, you get some feedback. And the feedback is, well... Yes, you're starting to admit that you're fearful, but the area you're thinking about when you face the unknown, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the way in which you are parenting the kids. You're so scared that they're going to turn out the wrong way that you're putting disproportionate amount of energy into your parenting and you're parenting out of fear, not out of love. Mm. And maybe after time you're open to, okay, well, maybe I'm fearful when it comes to my parenting. And and maybe every once in a while I might lose my temper. But still, let's not forget I'm a calm and cool, collected person. So again, you get some feedback. Hey, you're starting to get on track. So this is kind of what God does. And God wants us to align ourselves to truth. And it's not always bad things. It also could be another color metaphor. I'm very blue or depressed because I can't forgive myself. You've heard yourself say things like, I'll never forgive myself for what I've done. I'm really beating myself up over that. That's your thought. And maybe God's like, hey, the thought I want to give you is red representing forgiveness. You can be fully forgiven, not live under guilt, not beat yourself up for two more years, ten more years. So the process we're going to go through here in this series, Mastermind, is how do we incorporate feedback and be open to the truth without covering it up when it comes our way? See, mastering your mind is the art of talking truth to yourself. It's not just naive, optimistic thinking that might not be true. It's not always positive thinking. It's truthful thinking. And sometimes truth is very, very positive. Sometimes the truth requires you to challenge yourself and be challenged. But mastering your mind is the art of learning to talk truth to yourself and be open to truth. And so several people have written books or philosophies that have transformed the world. Aristotle, Socrates, his ability to ask questions, Plato. But one of the books that has shaped the Western world for the last 2,000 years is a letter written by a man named Paul to a group of Romans who had just become followers of Jesus. And he kind of summarizes the entire message of Christ 
through this letter to the Romans. And this letter and its theology and its philosophy and its psychology has transformed the world as we know it. So we're going to be looking at this book together, but the book kind of crescendos in chapter 12 when he says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but instead be transformed. Here's how you change. By the renewing of your mind. That the way in which you have currently been conformed to how you're thinking about how I parent, how I'm perceived, what's right, what's wrong. But you need to look at the way you've been currently conformed and then renew your mind by getting the truthful feedback to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you would be able to test what is the good and acceptable will of God. That's how you master your mind and make changes. So do that today. I want to look at two ways that we can master our mind, and by doing so, have less limits and more control. Because people who can't take feedback have limited themselves. They don't grow. You don't grow if you can't get truth. And here's the bottom line. Don't you know people, you go to a family reunion, and everyone knows everyone else's problems? Right? You sit around and talk, but everyone's, they don't see it, but oh, she always criticized her husband. You wouldn't believe the way he parents. He's got such an anger issue, right? We are all armchair quarterbacks when it comes to the, to the, to the family uh, dynamics. Well, if you talk about other people's blind spots, what do you think they're doing when you're not there? Right? Everyone else can see what you can't see. What is obvious to everyone else is the truth you've covered up. And by looking honestly at how to talk truth to yourself, you're going to learn how to take feedback, and you're going to also learn what are the lies that you're currently believing that are keeping you from taking feedback. So for example, maybe you've never perceived yourself as angry because that comes with a certain degree of condemnation because you knew people in your life who were angry, and at least you're better than them, and so it's hard for you to face up to being angry because with that comes a certain messaging of condemnation to yourself. And if there's some way we could extract the condemnation that maybe you could admit there's some areas that you struggle with anger, or maybe it's fear. And it's hard for you to believe that you're fearful because to be fearful is to be weak. And, and only weak people are fearful, and I would condemn myself if I was fearful. And until we can extract the condemnation, we're not able to maybe accurately see the feedback. And I want you to get free from the self-imposed limits you may not realize you have so you can more accurately see the truth and even see areas you might need to move things around in order to incorporate that feedback. All right? The first thing we're going to do, and, and Paul lays this out in Romans chapter 1, is we need to interrogate our excuses. We need to interrogate them because we are so prone to cover up and believe things that aren't true. So how do these excuses work? We have a tendency to excuse the truth, to rationalize the truth, to deflect the truth, to justify our actions. We've got so many different words for how we suppress the truth. Usually this begins with a bias. And Paul says our biggest bias is that we actually suppress the truth. Now this is a fascinating hypothesis. He says the problem is not a lack of evidence. You don't have a lack of evidence for God. It's all around you through creation. There isn't a lack of evidence for your bad behaviors. Everyone else knows, just not you. There isn't a lack of evidence to areas you need to grow. He says it this way. For all ungodliness or unrighteous of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. It's clearly, there's a moral code written on your heart. There's a, there's a demonstration of God's attributes in the heavens has been shown to them. This is really a challenging hypothesis because it says rather than saying I need proof and I haven't got it yet, Paul's saying no, you have the proof, you just keep suppressing it. And the word here in Greek for suppressing the truth always reminds me of my stellar career working at McDonald's. It, uh, it was two weeks it was only two weeks of, uh, I was a, uh, a, a, a referee for outdoor soccer and I was a referee for indoor soccer, but I had to make an insurance payment for two weeks. So I worked at McDonald's for two weeks. And, and they just didn't fully appreciate the artistry I brought to the job. So uh, as a cashier, you know, kids would come up and ask for ketchups and I'm making ketchups disappear and appear behind their ear and trying to bring a little joy into it. But one of the, the, the sought after uh, job responsibilities working at McDonald's was to pull out 
the trash masher. Now, if you've ever seen these, but there's an actual tool that you use for mashing trash. And so every once in a while, your boss would turn to you and say, hey, it's time to mash the trash. He wasn't quite that excited. And he'd hand me the stick, and I'd have to go over to the garbage, open it up, pull it out, and <coughs> so we could get more trash in there. Now, that's the word picture here that he's using, is that we have a tendency to mash down the truth. The truth just keeps coming out. There's just evidence of what you're doing, where you need to change. Other people have said it. Your circumstances have revealed it. But you just keep mashing it down. Now, one of the reasons I only worked for two weeks is because when I came out to mash the trash, it was like performance art time. And uh, Police Academy had just come out. And if you remember Police Academy, Motormouth was one of the main guys there. And Motormouth in Police Academy, he always would do those bad dub Japanese movies. And so I would come out with my metal trash masher with a small audience, you know, eating their McDonald's. And I'd be like, like a nunchuck spinning this thing around my body. And I'd be like, ah, I have come to mash trash. I will get you this time. Yes. Yes. I won. Now, this was good stuff. This was really good stuff. And apparently my boss didn't appreciate the potential danger of me spinning this uh, mash trashing stick around with all the uh, customers. So he didn't fire me, but I did quickly move back to refereeing soccer. This is the idea. He says, the biggest problem we have is our biggest bias is that we suppress, we cover up, we, we mash down the truth and the evidence that's around us. Well, that's true. We've got to interrogate our excuses because it's such a tendency to lie to ourselves. And those biases quickly become a because. A because. Our greatest because is often a, a, something we make up to cover up the way we've screwed up. So you say to somebody, hey, why, why didn't you start that business several years ago? Well, let me tell you, it's because it was the right wrong timing. It's because I just gotten married. It's because I was working on my grad school. Now, that might be partially true. And you've told yourself that enough times that it sounds good. But that because might be just be covering up the fact that you were scared. Nothing wrong with being scared, right? There's nothing wrong. But, but rather than admit that maybe... I was fearful and didn't do it. It's because something happened. Or somebody says, well, I feel like maybe uh, part of what's affecting our relationship is that you can be very jealous all the time. No, 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 I'm not jealous. Well, it's just because of the way you act. It's just because of the way you, well, I think the way you handle conflict may not be real healthy. No, it's because you're overly sensitive. It's because you, right? And so we deflect all this with this because. And so our bias we've suppressed some truth, becomes a because that we tell ourselves. And Paul goes on to say that these becauses are actually ways we cover up and make up excuses rather than admit that we screw up. And you've said this to other people. Right? You've seen this in your kids. You've seen this in grandkids. You see it in employees, right? It, well, you said, I think they're making up an excuse. And you're like, I think they believe it. Right? You know people who believe it? Some people are like maliciously lying. Some people, like they've told themselves a story so long, they believe it really happened. And you can tell that this is not a real bias. Oh, it's a bias. This has actually become true to them. It's their because story. Why don't you finally let go of that? Well, because my husband always does this. Why don't you let go of that? Well, because I was hurt so bad. Yeah, but it's still hurting you. So Paul loses this. He says, they became futile in their own thoughts, their thinking process, not being able to master their own minds. They began to think things, well, because I believe that now. And that began to affect how they feel. They got foolish hearts. I now feel shameful because of those thoughts. I feel superior because of those thoughts. I feel self-righteous because of those thoughts. And the lusts of their heart begin to drive them because they exchange the truth that they don't want to see that they've covered up for a lie that they want to believe. So the bias becomes a because, and then the because becomes an actual blind spot. And Paul's, again, very interesting. He says, our biggest blind spots occur when we've had a bias, it turned into a because, and now we're not even aware that we're anywhere distancing ourselves from the truth. He says, and at some point, God's going to say, all right, I've given you feedback. 
I've tried to bring people into your life and some circumstance in your life to show you that maybe this needs to be addressed or yes, you can be forgiven or whatever it is. Eventually, God gives you over to your debased mind. He's like, all right, why don't you go with that and see how that works out for you? And, and, and don't you know people who you had to fire them and they were shocked, I mean, just shocked that you had to fire them. And you're like, if anything, I waited too long. If anything, you know, your communication ability or your, your, your poor work ethic or your whatever it is, if anything, I've been too merciful. No, oh my goodness. And then, then that person is going to tell a story about how you were a bad boss because you were a bad boss, because no one understood, and they are blind, right? They are now given over to their debased mind. They are no longer doing what's fitting, and they are out of touch with reality. Well, here's my challenge. If the people you've seen that happen to, right, smart people, people you're related to, people that you've worked with, if they can have those blind spots, then maybe you can have those blind spots. So we've got to interrogate our excuses if we have any chance of getting close to the truth. Sometimes that's how we define ourselves. We may define ourselves not by maybe God says, I want you to define yourself by how I see you. Your creator loves you and cares for you. But we define ourselves by maybe what we own. Or maybe we define ourselves by, by the power we have. Or, or maybe we define ourselves by the titles and the territory we have. And we don't even realize that that very thing of defining ourselves by a certain thing is actually what's motivating a lot of our decision making. And God's saying, until you change how you see yourself, you're not going to change how you feel and react to things. I give an example. I have a friend who uh, works in the educational department. So he went up 10 years ago or so up to uh, Columbus to meet with one of our state senators. And he's talking to the state senator just about this different educational thing they're working on. And he noticed that the senator had a Bible sitting on his desk. And he says, well, can I ask you something? He says, sure. He says, I'm a person of faith. What made you, uh, what, what keeps a Bible here on your desk? Well, why do you do that? And the guy says, well, I'll tell you why. I need to constantly be realigned to the truth. He's like, well, okay, well, don't we all? He's like, yeah, but all day long, I have people walk in and out of this office saying, Senator so-and-so, Senator so-and-so, Senator so-and-so, because I have access to a certain amount of power, a certain amount of access to funds. And so when I hear people call me Senator long enough, I start to believe I'm more important than I really am. And probably prior to being a senator, I was a dentist. And people think just because I now have the title of senator, I'm now suddenly an expert on all subjects of all times. And I start to believe I'm an expert on all subject at all times. So I read this book to remind myself, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. That I am far more than my title as senator. That I don't want to live for the applause of man. So here is someone who's aware of the tendencies of his own job to create a way to see himself that may not be in line with truth. Or everyone calling him by a certain title, he may not... Be open to areas where he is fearful or angry or needs to change because people are deferring to him because they want something from him, right? I have another friend. He uh, does a Bible study up in Washington, D.C. I was talking to him recently. He's got two really good friends that do a Bible study together, both in the U.S. Congress. And they have decided to run against each other in this next race. But the one didn't know the other one was going to run against him. But this pastor friend knew that they were both doing it. So he's talking to the friend who is going to run against his buddy, and they've been good friends for many, many years, been in Bible studies for many, many years. And he said, well, do you think that's going to go over well? I mean, no matter what kind of politics goes on, there's always some mudslinging, and I just feel like this is a friend of yours, and it could really go bad. This guy's like, it won't go bad. It'll be fine. Now, how many times have you told yourself in any subject, it won't go bad. It'll be fine. How many times have your teenagers said, Mom, don't worry, it'll be fine. Dad, why are you making such a big deal about this? I won't get hurt. It won't go on that long. I won't stay that late, right? We all say this. And so this friend of mine I was talking to, he says, yes, I'm going to have a conversation. He, he so needs this. He's, he's not going to win this election, but he so needs to get into this election so he gets his name out there so he can win the next election. His need for 
positioning himself for the next thing is keeping him from seeing the obvious blind spots of how he's going to hurt a friendship. And so he just had that conversation a few weeks ago. His friend said, you know what? Okay, a friend of mine I trust is telling me this. Maybe I need to listen. This is certainly true in other areas of our life. So we got to interrogate our excuses if we have a chance of seeing the truth. The second thing we need to do is we need to investigate our, our selective judgments. And Paul goes on to talk about this in his second chapter, Romans. He says, we have this moral code put on our own hearts. And it reminds us that you're inexcusable. You don't live up to your own standards. And yet, you selectively apply a judgment to somebody else, and you selectively apply it differently to yourself. He says, therefore, you're inexcusable, O man, for whoever you judge, for whatever you judge, another you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. What does that mean? Well, haven't you said to yourself, you've been on the receiving end of gossip, for example? Or maybe your kids have been on the receiving end of gossip. You felt the sting and the malice of that. You've said, people shouldn't gossip. That girl, that guy, that company, that employee was wrong for gossiping, right? So your standard, you're judging somebody else for gossiping. Paul's saying, and guess what? You judge other people for gossiping. Have you ever gossiped? Well, yeah, it's kind of fun to gossip. Mm Mm-hmm. You've said you're driving your car, right? And you're getting into kind of road rage mode. But it's not road rage. It's justified. Because that idiot in front of me is going too slow. And so you're trying to get around the idiot in front of you. Next thing you know, you get around him. And you look behind you as a moron. You know what a moron is? The people who are trying to go too fast behind you. And so now you're like, look at that moron behind me. I got an idiot in front of me going too slow. And I got a moron behind me going too fast. Then you realize you're the idiot to that moron. And you're the moron to that idiot. You are practicing the very things you're judging, right? You say to other people, I don't want anybody lusting after my wife or lusting after my daughter. But haven't you ever lusted after somebody else's wife or somebody else's daughter? That's Paul's point here is that you don't live up to your own standards. And you tell yourself, I'm basically a good person because I filtered out anything that says I'm not a good person. I've covered up anything that shows I screw up. And I've magnified everything I've done right. So we have to zoom in and really investigate, have I fallen short of my own standards? Yeah. If so, I need forgiveness. And I could work hard. If I just work hard enough, I can make myself better. But how often do you need to work to get to perfection? Good luck. And God says, instead of working harder, working harder, what if instead you swapped out working harder? Just admit it. You don't live up to your own standards. You're, you're guilty of the very things you judge. You say be tolerant, but then you're intolerant of the people you consider intolerant. Right? You judge the judges. You hate the haters. You say hating is wrong, but then it's okay for you to hate. All of the ways at which we practice the very things that we condemn. What if you began to swap and say, I admit I'm not as good of a person as I think I am. And rather than trying to convince myself or others I'm better than I think I am, I'm going to admit that I fall short of my own standards, and I'm going to replace that with God's forgiveness. And God's like, bing! Now we're getting someplace. But as long as you're going to delude yourself into thinking that you're not falling short of your own standards, how do you operate in a realm where you're not being truthful? You see, at the end of your life, you have two choices. Either God is your defense attorney, or you'll be cross-examined by your own conscience. God says, at the end of your life, you can come and say, listen, I did lots of stuff wrong, and God will say, that's right, you did, but thank goodness I'm your defense attorney, and I forgave it all, I covered it up, I forgave it all. So you can admit where you're wrong, you can be open to feedback because anything that your wife brings up or your boss brings up or your son brings up, there's a strong possibility it could be true. It's maybe one of those areas you don't live up to your own judgments. It's maybe one of those areas God had to forgive you for. You're just more open. Or at the end of your life, you could be cross-examined by your own conscience. And that's what Paul says here. He says, 
at the end of your life, God is only going to evaluate you based on your standard of right and wrong. What could be more fair than that? He says, Gentiles who didn't have the law, didn't have the Bible, God's not going to hold them accountable to the law. Instead, he's written a law on their heart, your own moral code that you don't live up to. You're going to be held accountable to your own moral code. And to Jews, those who had a Bible growing up, he'll hold you accountable to what you know. But at the end of the day, if you're, look at the words he uses, your heart, your conscience, your thoughts, and your secrets. If you were cross-examined by your thoughts, by your secrets, and by your conscience, Paul's saying your own conscience would cross-examine you and prove that you're not being honest with yourself. You knew that you had an anger problem. You knew that you dealt with fear. You knew that you didn't react well and that you were critical because you saw it in your parents or you saw it in a previous boss. You just kept mashing the trash down. Reminds me one time, we were at CCD, uh, Cincinnati Country Day School, before we moved in here 13 years ago. And so I invited a buddy of mine, he's a rabbi, to come and to, to sit on stage with me and he could ask me his hardest questions. So we just had a great dialogue, and the whole time he tried to convince me he was a, basically a good person because he followed Torah, and I said, well, surely your kids disobey. My kids do not disobey. I train them according to the Bible. Well, I train my kids according to the Bible, and they disobey just like their dad. So I mean, it was just an amazing conversation that he was kind of building up the whole time what a good person he was, and I'm like, listen, I am loved, and I'm not living under condemnation, but I am not a good person. Thank goodness God's forgiven me. So after just a really great dialogue, fun dialogue, at the end, we got two minutes left on the clock, and he says, can I ask you one last question? Sure. I look at two minutes, I'm thinking it's like, hey, how can we work together, you know, something like that. He looks at me, he says, do you think I'm going to hell? <laughs> you pass the cookies. Um, I said, well, at the end of your life, you have two choices, forgiveness or fairness. And God says that if you want a fair trial, he'll give it to you. And you've told me for the last half hour what a good person you are. Your bad deeds aren't nearly that bad. Your good deeds are really that good. And so God's going to give you a chance to have exactly what you asked for, which is a fair trial where your conscience and your secrets and your thoughts cross-examine that claim. He's like, well, then why are you trying to tell me about Jesus? I'm a rabbi. I said, because I don't think you're going to do very well in that trial. Because I don't think I would do very well in that trial. I don't want a fair trial. I want forgiveness. Because I want to stand before God and say, everything you heard about me that I've done wrong is true and probably so much more. But thank goodness you're my defense attorney and you've forgiven me for it. Now here's why that's important. Because if that message of the Bible is true, it transforms your ability here and now to hear truth. You see, grace is God's forgiveness. Grace is how God gives you something you don't deserve. You didn't earn it. You weren't good enough for it. Grace covers up the condemnation so that we can uncover the truth. What if discovering you have a problem with anger didn't have to come with the condemnation? What if whatever you found out about yourself, you find out but it's already been forgiven and it doesn't come with that sting of condemnation? Paul's going to develop his point to Romans 8 and say, therefore, there is right now for those who get this message, no condemnation, no blanket of guilt. God can extract the guilt. And so you say, whatever I discover that my wife brought up, that my employee brought up, that my boss brought up, that my 360 review brought up, whatever I find, it's not going to come with condemnation. It might sting a little bit, but not condemned. And I'm going to say, you know what? I might have some anger issues I need to deal with. But because it doesn't come with condemnation, I'm actually more open to the truth. I can uncover the truth of what might be true about myself because whatever I find doesn't have that condemnation with it. I might have areas that I've allowed fear to drive me and make decisions that hurt other people. But if I can extract the condemnation for myself and others, I'm open to that. Grace, the gift of forgiveness from God, the idea that he can forgive everything you've done past, present, and future. It covers up the condemnation so that you can uncover the truth. And whatever you find, whatever you discover, and whatever you decode 
can bring freedom. I'll tell you one last story. I had a friend who uh, was on staff here with us, um, part-time, and I had to address something with them. It was a, an issue in, uh, that needed to be addressed, and so, and again, I had good friends with this person, both off stage and on stage, and so I sat down with him to have this meeting, and I said, hey, uh, we'd just like to share a few things, some team dynamics I think would be helpful. And as we were talking a little bit, very gracious, very kind, I tried to be as, as, as uh, graceful as I could, and I got done talking. I said, well, here, here's one issue that I think would be helpful for the whole team and an area that I'd like to see you grow in. So we finished the conversation. I felt a little sting from it, but, but I said, but I want you to know you are loved and you are appreciated, and this is, not, this is part of us growing together as a team. And I said, can I share one verse from the Bible with you? And they said, yeah. And I, and I read that verse we just read. Everything I'm saying here doesn't come with condemnation or judgment. It's because I want to help you grow. Romans 8.1, there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. I said, now, my, what's probably going to happen, though, is you're going to leave this meeting where you feel the love, you can see my eyes, you can see in my, in my heart, and you're going to go home, and you're going to start rehearsing this, and you're going to say, mm, no, this can't be true. And then you're going to say, Chad's really angry, and Chad's really mean, and I can't believe he said this. And, and, and then you're going to come up with a whole different story than what happened. No, that won't happen. Okay, well, good. I don't want that to happen, too. I just want us to grow together. Well, sure enough. <laughs> We went home, but a week later I get this email, you know, no longer wanted to be involved, and for three years we didn't talk. And I just kept trying to find ways to, to initiate. So finally I found a way to reinitiate, and the person came back to my office, it was three years later, and they said, I, I want to talk about what happened three years ago. I said, oh, I'd love to. I said, before we get into that, can I ask you one question? They said, sure. I said, do you remember me opening the Bible at the end? They said, Yeah. You, I shared one verse with you. Do you remember what it was? No, probably some, you know, you're a terrible person verse. <laughs> I know the only verse I ever shared with you is from Romans 8.1. It says, the spirit of this whole thing is there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Their jaw dropped. They said, that's the thing you shared with me? Yeah. I've been telling myself how mean and nasty you were and how you read me the Ten Commandments or something for the last three years. I'm like, yeah, no. It's just an area I want you to take a little feedback in to grow in and maybe move something from one area to one area or, or maybe address something in your area. But the whole thing is from a spirit of wanting to help you change. And it changed our dynamic and it restored some of the pain from a blind spot from years earlier. Your spouse, your company, your boss is longing for you to incorporate some of the feedback that you've been covering up. And maybe if you've never experienced the message of Jesus and that forgiveness, you know, you, you want to receive that or you want to go public with that. We have a baptism coming up in a few weeks and you can sign up for that. And I want to know more about that message. Or maybe you want to learn some techniques on how to be a better listener. Maybe you've, you've had a spouse who said, hey, um, not listening, not listening, not listening. All right, well, okay, you listen to the kids, but not to me. All right, well, how about, okay, I want you to listen to me. So we're doing a, a third part of our God's Home Info series for men tonight. It's interchangeable tomorrow morning. And get the notes in the program where we're going to learn how to be a better listener and what does it look like to really listen and try and respond to the feedback of the people in our life whether it's our kids or employees or our spouses have said you just don't listen well let's make some changes and let's do it by changing our thoughts let's pray father thank you for our time this morning thank you for the incredible love we can have when we can trust that whatever feedback you give us it's because you care for us you want the best for us and Father, make us people who are humble enough to hear feedback and open enough to make changes. In Jesus' name, amen. Just keep a state of mind you're in If 
you make changes in whatever form that takes and whatever area that takes in your life. And so this series is going to be a combination of building on that. We're going to find next week that, uh, you know, we don't actually react to people and circumstances. We react to what we think about people and circumstances. So if we can change how we think about people and circumstances, we get control of how we react, how we feel, and how we move forward. Thanks for being here today. We'll see you next week as we continue our series on Mastermind. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.